Hello and welcome to Carfile. Now on this week's programme we're looking at rough, tough off-roaders and they don't come much more in your face than the Nissan Patrol. Here's Richard Hammond. Perfect. Well we can't all be Crocodile Dundee types, but if you feel you need to up your butch quota, then try this. Grr. It's the Nissan Patrol, and in parts of the world where both the terrain and people can get seriously roughy dufty, it's seen as being one of the best full size luxury off roaders. Which on our country roads can lead to a bit of a problem, and they're quite narrow. Ah, um. Ah. I just. Uh, hello? Is there anyone around? I can't. Um, you know. It doesn't make any attempt to hide the fact that it is massive. Seriously, you might as well get up in the morning, wander downstairs to the kitchen, put the kettle on and start the house and pull away on the school run with the kids still in bed. It is that big. Three litre direct injection diesel up front. Nissan used pretty clever technology to squeeze every last ounce of power out of it. Boy, do they need it because there is a huge amount of car to move along here. You're very much aware of the unsprung weight, the weight of the wheels and the suspension and the brakes, all the bits that are after the suspension springs, which makes it feel rather ponderous. That said, for something of this size, well, it ain't bad. It's got adjustable stabiliser at the back on the anti-roll bar, which means when you're driving on the road, you can switch it on and it'll stabilise out some of that wobble and roll. As soon as you go off-road, you don't want that, so you can switch it off. And that gives you a hint. It might look big and brutal, well, it is but it does have on board a huge amount of technology. Of course, one of the advantages of having a car as big as a football stadium is that you can fit loads of people in it, and with a third row of seats folded out at the back, you can get seven people in with ease. But it is very, very big, and you can feel rather lonely. Hello? Hello, is there anybody else in here at all? Hello? I'm lonely up here. At last, this is what I've been waiting for all day, my chance to put this thing through its test out here in the real world. Now, come on! Oh, my God, this is, this is so boring. Well, hey, come on, not everybody lives in the middle of the Andes or the Pyrenees. In fact, if ever you were to get into difficulty off-road, this thing is more than likely to get you out. That said, Let's be honest, we are talking mounting the curb outside the wine bar here, being the limit of its explorations. We've got electrically adjustable seats in pretty much every direction, air conditioning of course, electric windows, heated mirrors. We've also got a rather nifty electric compass, none of those nasty stick-on round ones. This one up here digitally gives me an indication as to where I'm going. I'd rather know what road I'm on, but it's nice to know I'm going west. If you really are determined to hit the WAF stuff, it's got pretty much everything you could need. Obviously it's switchable between two-wheel and four-wheel drive, and there is an extra low-ratio four-wheel drive gearbox if it gets extremely rough. If it gets even rougher than that, you've got a remotely switchable diff lock. Mmm, nice. Now let's be honest, I don't suppose anybody ever bought one of these by accident. Oh, they said afterwards. Didn't realise it was an off-roader. Well, obviously it is. And if what you're after is an off-roader, capable of carrying seven people in luxury and comfort and towing the house they came out of, then this is it. Yours for about 32 grand. If though you're after a big luxury car, then you might be looking elsewhere. Still, it's certainly got presents. Right, that's enough macho nonsense. I need to get in touch with my feminine side. Somebody bring me on an MGF, I think. Well, next up, it's a head-to-head -head battle between Korea and Europe as we pitch the Freelander against the Hyundai Santa Fe. Now, not too long ago, the only positive feature about buying a Korean car was the price tag. But in more recent years, all that's changed. Indeed, Hyundai's own coupe has gone down an absolute storm in this country, and they hope to continue that success with this, the new Santa Fe. The Santa Fe marks Hyundai's attack on the popular sports utility vehicle market putting it head-to-head -head with the likes of the Land Rover Freelander and Toyota's RAV4. And what else could we compare Hyundai's new Santa Fe with but Europe's best-selling small off-roader, the Land Rover Freelander? Looks play an important part in this sector, owners are usually more concerned with looks than outright off-road ability. 
The sales of this car suggest that in the Lux department, Land Rover must be doing it right with the Freelander. Despite criticism at launch that the front end looked like a boat, revisions to the car last year were limited to a redesigned front bumper, clear front indicator lenses and an enlarged and lower air intake. The Santa Fe was designed by Hyundai's Los Angeles design facility. Hyundai claimed this was to ensure the car is suitable for western markets. From the back the car looks very butch and macho, the perfect thing for off-roading, but as you move down the side into the front you get a mismatch of curves, supposedly to echo the coupe. However, if like me you're no fan of the coupe's looks, you might be a bit disappointed, but it does kind of grow on you after a few days. Now due to the recent problems in the countryside, we're not able to test either of these two vehicles off-road, but as it's highly unlikely that either of them are going to see sight and sound of a field in a lifetime, what's more important is how they go on-road. Well Hyundai don't actually make any great claims about the off-road ability of the Santa Fe, and that's because it's an SUV or sports utility vehicle, and that means it's designed more for use on-road or tracks and fields rather than out and out rocky mountain tracks. Now this model's powered by a 2.7 litre V6 producing 177 brake horsepower and that pushes the big Korean to 60 miles an hour in a little over 11 seconds and you get a top speed of 113 miles an hour and the fuel consumption's not bad either at just over 25 miles to the gallon. There's full-time four-wheel drive and a four-speed automatic gearbox designed by Porsche nonetheless and that makes for a very stable and firm ride. Cracks and potholes in the road make no difference to the Santa Fe and that V6 engine is very quiet and again super smooth. In fact it's more like driving a big saloon car. Now saloon car drivers will notice a little bit more body roll when you drive one of these vehicles but it's nothing too alarming and even on some of the sharper corners you never feel that the car is going to lose its composure or you're going to end up in the field. Now even though Hyundai are pitching the Santa Fe to compete with the likes of the RAV4 and the Freelander its size puts it more in between the Freelander and the Discovery, so straight away it's got an advantage on its competitors. It really is very spacious in here and there's enough room to sit five adults very comfortably and the boot is absolutely enormous. Now on this V6 Santa Fe, leather seats come as standard and although there's no options list as such, the amount of specification that you do get on the standard car is quite impressive. There's air conditioning, CD player, driver passenger airbags and electric mirrors, windows and sunroof. But where the Santa Fe is let down is with the interior. The plastics and switch gear are pretty ugly and it's certainly not as high quality as many of its rivals. Now whilst it might not have the size of the Santa Fe, this five door Freelander is still very roomy and there's bags of space in the back for your luggage. Now the specification on this ES model is pretty similar to the Hyundai in that you get leather seats, air conditioning, CD player, driver passenger airbags and electric mirrors, windows and sunroof. Now the interior on the early Freelanders was a little bit suspect, very plasticky, but the revisions made last year have gone some way to improving that. It all feels that little bit more refined now, better put together and the materials feel quite solid and quite expensive. Not too keen on the colour scheme but something like that you could live with. We know the Freelander performs extremely well off-road, in fact it's the leader in its class. Now this particular one I'm driving today, like the Santa Fe, it's got a V6, only this time 2.5 litres and it's taken straight from the Rover 75 and it gives the car a whole new sense of urgency. 0 to 60 takes just 10 seconds and your top speed again 113 miles an hour. For that engine package you do really have to push it hard to get the performance and of course your fuel consumption is going to suffer and it brings it down to about 23 miles to the gallon. For a car that handles as well as the Freelander off-road you'd expect there'd be some compromise when it comes to on-road. Well it's clear the Land Rover boys have been working very very hard and this car feels absolutely superb. Very stable, very safe and very composed. And you'd be surprised on some of these bends when your instinct is to lift off, you keep your power on and you just whiz around them, no problems. Another area that's really surprised me on the Freelander is the amount of cabin space. It's extremely roomy and if you got in blindfolded well you'd swear you were driving a Discovery. Starting at £15,999 for the 2.4 litre petrol to £18,000 for this 2.7 litre V6, Hyundai's new Santa Fe represents excellent value for money. Throw in a three year unlimited mileage warranty and three years RAC assistance and it's hard to see why the Santa Fe wouldn't make sense. Diesel lovers should hold their breath as later in the year there'll be a 2 litre common rail diesel model of the car. There are three different body styles available for the Freelander, hardback, softback three-door models and this, the five-door. And you get a choice of three engines at the moment, a 1.8 petrol, 
a two litre diesel and the one we've been driving today, a two and a half litre V6. So for the basic 1.8 petrol three door and they go right up to 24,595 for a fully equipped two and a half litre V6. Now there's no doubt that over the past decade Hyundai have come on a heck of a long way and this Santa Fe is the best car that they've ever launched in this country. Now whether you like the looks or not it certainly performs very well and it brings genuine value for money to the SUV market. But where it's going to lose sales to the Freelander is on the badge. But if you can put badge snobber behind you and going off road isn't your main criteria, well you could save yourself four grand and do a lot worse than a Santa Fe. Well that's it for part one, but after the break we see if the Land Rover Discovery is a good alternative to the luxury Audi A6. We'll see you soon. Meet Mr Smith and Mr Jones. They both live in a little village within commuting distance of the big city. Image is important to both of them. Mr Smith works in the big town and drives an Audi A6 4.2 Quattro V8. His car is intended to reflect his desired status and work. Mr. Jones is a country estate agent. He loves to go hiking and fishing in his spare time. His four litre discovery reflects his lifestyle and sets him apart from the serfs in the village. Now then, you two, what I'd like you to do is actually to swap cars just for the day. And let's see if your personal choice of lifestyle car is really necessary for your lifestyle. Now, come on. No more pulling face. That's it. Good. Now, that's enough of that kind of thing. Now, off you go and play. We'll see how you get on in a short while. One of the first things that Mr Jones would notice on climbing in here is that compared to the airy cabin of the Discovery, it's really rather gloomy in here thanks to the dark leathers and plastics used. But then he'd start to notice just the subtle quality of all the materials used, the chrome on the door handles, the very nice quality feel to the leather and the plastic. It is rather like sliding into a very well-appointed, if very small, boardroom for what must be a very important and serious meeting. But the overriding impression, and probably the first thing to hit Mr Jones, would be the fact that compared to the lofty perch of the Discovery from where you can see over hedges, you really do feel sat very close to the ground. Obviously to drive, the A6 is a completely different prospect. No matter how good the engineering that's gone in to make the Discovery as close to a road car as possible, it's never going to be a match for the kind of low wide stance of a car like this and the development work that's gone into that suspension. It really is a very different driving proposition. It uses its V8 very, very differently. Applying the power, yes, through four wheels, but in a very different way. It's a much more sporty drive. It's much happier belting along either country roads or motorways, but particularly big motorways. Well, having rid myself of the constraints of a jacket and tie, the first thing that Mr. Smith notices on stepping into the Discovery is that, of course, it's higher. It also feels a lot roomier, a lot airier, a lot lighter. The fabric and trim all round is more brighter than the sombre Audi. It's very comfortable. You can see this as a cruiser on the motorway doing 90 or so. It's almost an armchair on wheels, put it on cruise control and it's great. And of course you have this high up driving position that you just don't get with the Audi. Performance wise, it's not bad. It can nip quite easily through this five speed gearbox. Uh, handling though is another matter. Try and push this hard down country lanes like the Audi and you may come unstuck. Not surprisingly, our Mr Jones enjoys a spot of hunting, shooting and fishing and he'd be relieved to find that there's more than enough room in the boot of this A6 for all of his kit. There's even a little guard to keep the gun dog at bay. But here's a bit of a worry. The first time Mr Jones returns with a muddy set of waders and an old wax jacket from a day's fishing, well, this boot is not going to look quite as pristine as it does now. It is, if anything, a little bit posh and perhaps it's a bit too posh for Mr Jones's purposes. And there's another worry. 
the Discovery will be able to romp its way perhaps a little closer to that lake with all of the fishing kit. But this, I reckon, is about as far as this car is going to get. I do hope that Mr. Jones is looking after my Audi, not getting it too dirty. Now, as you can see, the Discovery is still a very big car. It's actually not quite as long as the A6 Avant, which is interesting, but it's wider and it takes a fair bit of maneuvering to get it in and out of tight car parking spaces like this. But once you get it in, well, have a look at the rear space, smart two individual child seats. They're smart as well. I just wonder whether perhaps this Discovery has the same sort of image that the Audi does, whether it's maybe a bit more down market, dare I say, than the Audi. Perhaps if you want a 4x4, the Range Rover would be the one to go for over the A6 Avant. Whoa! I think one thing Mr. Jones would definitely enjoy is accelerating from 0 to 60 miles an hour in 7.1 seconds, which in a car this size is pretty impressive, even though it is nowhere near as big as the Discovery. But therein lies an important point. It is, what, 300 knot brake horsepower from that V8. It's a very powerful car. And sure, it's nowhere near as big as the Land Rover, but it is still a big estate car. And there are some moments on country lanes when perhaps all that extra power and extra speed is more likely to get you into trouble than you would do in a Land Rover. You're going to be going faster than this on occasions. And there are moments when I certainly wouldn't like to meet a tractor coming the other way. Having said all of that, it is still a very enjoyable thing to drive and I think Mr. Jones would rather enjoy that extra turn of speed and that ability to go just that little bit faster. After all, who doesn't enjoy a bit of extra speed? I really enjoyed the Audi, but I think Mr. Jones is going to miss a few things about his old Discovery. For a start, you're not going to be worried about getting the thing mucky, and there are definite advantages to that high up driving position in this lofty, airy cabin. And then there's a proper off-road four-wheel drive system with a high and low ratio gearbox and with a clever descent gizmo to help you get down really steep hills. And there's no need to sacrifice any of life's little comforts either. Mr. Jones is quite accustomed to his electric seats, to his electric mirrors and his electric sunroof. Now, as much as I like the Discovery, it's great to get back to the solid feel of the Audi, where quality is absolutely paramount. Superb quality finishes too, and plastics that are just excellent. You also get clever storage ideas, like these two bins in the doors. You get electric seats with lumbar support that adjusts to your back, plus Tiptronic gearbox that adapts to your driving style, and of course you can change gear manually should you wish to, plus climate control, with individual controls for both the driver and front seat passenger. Well, it may not be quite as elegantly installed, but there are individual controls for front seat passenger and driver on the automatic air conditioning in the Discovery. And then for rear seat passengers, well, useful gizmos include an incredibly nifty mechanism for when there are only two passengers getting rid of the rear centre headrest and providing a useful armrest, complete with rather vicious looking cup holders. Wouldn't want to get caught up in those. Then when you are on a long journey, there's plenty of places to accumulate all that gubbins that you take with you. For instance, we have pouches in the rear of the front seats and these useful overhead cargo nets. Now, although you don't get the high up seating position of the Discovery in the Audi, obviously, back here is a very civilized place. After all, who needs to look over hedges when you can relax back here with 
a centre armrest, absolutely perfect, which also has a centre storage area, two individual cup holders as well for rear seat passengers. It's just a civilised place to spend a few hours on a long journey. And there are some clever touches back here. And it's also back here that quality is absolutely paramount, along with some very clever touches. For instance, quality carpet that wouldn't look out of place in some people's living room. Heaven forbid putting a pair of muddy wellies on there or boots. Also chrome handles and chrome hooks for keeping luggage safe. A damped 12 volt adapter socket there. And it's not just the discovery that can come with seven seats because the A6 Avant can have an optional set of rear facing child seats, which makes a grand total of seven people to carry. Well, it may not quite so closely resemble the luxurious business departures lounge at a comfortable airport, but it is nevertheless pretty pleasant in here in a gentleman's club sort of way. And it is, after all, an off-roader. Now, there's accommodation back here for another two people, and it's extremely clever. When you don't need it, it stows away thus, with the headrest folding up into the roof and the rear seat folding sideways into the boot space itself. When they are in sight, then the rear seat passengers have luxurious little touches like their own individual cup holders and tray down by the side and even control for each person over the CD player. And I call that rather clever thinking. So there we are. Mr Smith and Mr Jones can both be assured that they have cars which are certainly built to last, despite a £10,000 or so price difference. The question is, would they ever agree on which to buy? Well, that's it from myself and the Carfile team, but we will be back very soon with more in-depth looks at the car industry. We'll see you soon.